Welcome to a Marketing Sherpa Mech Labs webinar sponsored by Trusty. We're going to talk today about how to optimize your banner ad performance while also complying with new privacy regulations. I know uh, when I heard first about this uh, topic, it was very interesting to me because I've read, as I'm sure you have, a lot about privacy regulations lately. Um, in fact, in the newspaper this morning in the Wall Street Journal, there were two articles about privacy regulations. One about Google and Buzz uh, getting in trouble with the FTC and having to pay a significant penalty for that and another one about these uh, new uh, tracking technologies uh, for Internet Explorer and Firefox, how companies are looking to give consumers an option whether they want to or do not want to be tracked. So I'm sure you're as interested as I am, how can you comply with these privacy regulations while also maximizing your marketing performance? So today on the line we have myself, I'm Daniel Burstein, the Director of Editorial Content here at Mech Labs. You probably know us better by our publishing brands, Marketing Experiments and Marketing Sherpa. I have with me Spencer Whiting, a research analyst here in Mech Labs Conversion Group. He works with some Fortune 500 companies, helping them optimize their online banner ads. And actually, the presentation we're working off of, the nexus of it started when one of our uh, major research partners, at, again, Fortune 500 company in the financial service industry, unfortunately, I can't uh, name them, but uh, they were asking Spencer about how can they optimize their banner ads, and he, he started putting some thoughts together, put this together based on some of our research and some of our optimization uh, heuristics. We also have Bob Bramaport, Vice President of Business Development at Trustee, and uh, I love introducing people. I get to look in their bios, and Bob's got a few interesting things in there. Uh, before Trustee, he managed Yahoo's search toolbar business, which is, I think is very interesting. He's also active on the Board of Advisors of StumbleUpon, and uh, he's got an MBA from uh, Northwestern, but also before that, his bachelor's was from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. So while Bob can answer a lot of questions about privacy and banner ads, and, and we're here to answer all your questions, there's a lot going on in the world now. I don't know if you've noticed. And so since you went to the School of Foreign Service, maybe if we have time again, Bob, you can answer a few questions around that as well, help, help our State Department out. Yeah, I'll, I'll solve the Libyan problem. <laughs> That'd be great, Bob. Though. We'd love that. So. Um, so let's uh, just briefly, if you are not familiar with Trustee, the company has been around about 15 years. They're out of San Francisco. They've got over 3,000 clients, so a lot of brand name clients you've likely heard of, and they offer privacy certifications in lots of different ways. One we're going to talk about today, uh, not specifically about Trustee Solution, but about what they've learned about um, advertising, that second one over there, how you can help with your banner ads to um, make sure that your customers know that their privacy is being respected and you're complying with all regulations. Um, but this is not uh, like a normal webinar. Hopefully, we're not just wanting to talk at you for an hour about everything we've learned. We want to hear what you've learned as well. Uh, you can share that using the Twitter hashtag Sherpa webinar, and you can tell us everything uh, you found out about optimizing banner ads and everything you found out about uh, privacy regulations. You can also ask questions using hashtag Sherpa webinar, and you can ask questions as well through the Q&A feature of uh, GoToWebinar. Uh, with that, let's get started. Uh, what are we going to talk about today, Spencer? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about banners and privacy. Uh, basically, we've got a four-section presentation here today. We've got an introduction at marketing experiments. We're always looking at analyzing before we do anything to make sure that our performance, we have a performance base that we can build off of. And then we're going to look at the, at the ad sequence, creating new banner ads, and then we're going to look at privacy uh, from Trust E. I'm very excited to hear about the trustee part of it because, frankly, that's something that, that I haven't really been aware of or done any testing around, and I really think it's going to be something we're going to be working with in the future. Uh, just a note, if you have any questions, please ask them while we go along. It's going to be uh, a good presentation, uh, but uh, we will have questions at the end, but certainly if something uh, hits you in the middle, ask it. If we're going to answer that question later, we'll just let you know about that. Uh, but we want to have your involvement here because we want it to be good for you. Um, so starting out, always got to start with key terminology. Certainly everybody knows what a web banner is, what an impression is, clicks, click-through rate, conversion rate, and call to action. Uh, those are all very important in the testing that we do at Marketing Experiments, and I'll let Bob share about the privacy uh, definitions there. So yes, as, as privacy becomes an ingredient in everything we do online, both as consumers and businesses, some new terminology is creeping into, into the ad space. One which you may have already seen commonly referred to as online behavioral advertising or its uh, other aliases, uh, behavioral targeting or BT, is simply using uh, a consumer's or user's browsing history to make targeting decisions uh, about 
uh, what ads what to serve ad? and when to serve the ad. Uh, the second term, which you may have heard, is with um, the rise of online behavioral advertising, there's an industry effort by the ad industry itself to self-regulate in an effort to prevent what could be more uh, arduous regulations from the government directly. And an entity has been created called the DAA, the Digital Advertising Alliance, which is overseeing the self-regulation effort both from a compliance standpoint as well as an enforcement standpoint. And then finally, uh, we keep mentioning self-regulation. Um, there is something called the self-regulatory principles, you know, principles with a capital P you will often hear. This is something um, that the principles themselves were written back in 2009. They are sort of the constitution of self-regulation. They are the rules by which uh, self-regulation uh, should live by. And the program itself is officially launched in October. And we'll, as we go through this presentation, we'll get dig deeper into what exactly those principles are. So as you execute your advertising campaigns, which may use uh, behavioral advertising, what you, should be, what you should be aware of in terms of meeting those principles. Thank you, Bob. Before we get started in my presentation, I want you to think back to the first, uh, the last time you clicked on a banner, um, and what attracted your attention to that banner? What need were you looking for to fulfill with that, and why did you click on that banner? It's something to think about, especially if you're creating banners. You need to know your clients, your customers, your visitors, and why they might want to buy with you. Um, so. I think about banners uh, basically as a cover of a book. When you go into a library or you go into Barnes and Noble, the first thing the book has to do is it has to catch your attention. Then what it has to do is it has to build your interest. And then it has to ask you to open it. So then you buy it. So that's the only purpose of the banner. So in an introduction, the, the banner is constructed from an image primarily. It can be a text uh, link also that can be considered a, a uh, banner. We also have landing pages, and then the application pages are the sales page. In this situation, we're looking at our upcoming optimization summit. Uh, it's a shameless plug for this uh, event, um, and uh, we figured we'd use that and how we do that. So uh, what the purpose of the banner is to bring qualified traffic to your sales funnel and to get them to convert. So. As I said, the purpose of the banner is gain a visitor's in attention, get a visitor's interest, and then ask for and get a click. Purpose of the landing page. First thing is, when somebody comes to your landing page, they, ne they need to know where are they. You know, do they know that this is where we're going to go? How many times have we clicked on something and the page looks completely different and bang, we're out of there, we're gone in two seconds? Well, you need to make sure that they feel comfortable. Then you have to tell them what they can do there. You need to manage the thought process. And then finally, they, you've got to, tell, you've got to present to them, why should I spend my money with you? They make an important point there, Spencer. I don't, want, I don't want that to get lost as we go through this quickly. I mean, we've already been asked um, you know, if there's going to be a download, a quick sheet download available after. We do have a checklist at the end of this. We're going to be distributing that through the Marketing Sherpa Best of Weekly Newsletter. You can go to marketingsherpa.com to sign up. You don't have to feel like you have to take notes. But I want to make sure we don't miss the point. When you say the purpose of the banner is to gain a visitor's attention, interest, and ask for a click, what are many marketers doing wrong that you found? Well, primarily people are trying to make the sale on the banner um, before people are ready. You've got to warm them up. Um, you've got to have them ready for that sale. And, and Dr. Flynn McLaughlin talks very often about having that nexus point where they have enough interest, they have enough need, you're presenting the option for that need and they feel like you can satisfy that need, boom, you've got the sale. And we're in the business of getting people to that point for our clients more often than any, any other. Um, so that's the purpose and that's where we're going from. One of the things as a research lab, we're always looking at analysis and why is something doing what it's doing. We want to see data, we want to see metrics, we want to see what's going on. So first what we do when we're looking to optimize a banner is we want to see where it is. What's around it? Is the content on that page relevant to that banner? And are there competing elements? We've all been to those banner, those uh, websites that have banners all over the place. They're blinking. It's like you're walking down the, the strip in Las Vegas, and it's like, I want to be bigger and get your attention. 
ah, that, so you got to use a different strategy, that type of thing. Then we look at the traffic funnel analysis. Evaluate how many people are coming into the funnel, how many are getting to the next level, how many are ultimately converting. So we look at that. Then we need to look at the message continuity. Is the banner saying the same thing that the landing page is saying and offering the same thing that's on the sales page? So that's where we're looking at it. So let's look at that in more detail. So looking at the placement analysis, we're looking at the competing banners. We've already mentioned a little bit about that, what colors are going on, what movement. We're looking at the page content. If you're selling software for um, sales and uh, customer relation, uh, customer CRM software, uh, you don't want to be on a page that's talking about puppy dogs. Probably not really uh, very relevant. Then we're looking at the location. Now this uh, graph here, this came from Google. Now certainly Google wants their people who are using AdSense to get the maximum value out of their banner placement so that Google can make the maximum amount of money. That's what we're here for, right, is to make more money. So what we look here is the bright, the darker red is the primary spot. The reason that is it's in the middle of the content. People are looking there. We'll cover it a little bit later. But if it matches the need that that person is trying to fulfill, they'll click. The next one is the orange, where the eye path normally is. The yellow is, is third, and the white is is not the best, but in some ways it can be okay depending upon the content of the page and the quality of the banner and of your value proposition. So what we're going to look at now is, is Daniel's going to talk a little bit about our conversion heuristic that we use here at Marketing Experiments. Yeah, thanks, Spencer. So, so that was a lot of important analysis, but I know one thing uh, marketers are interested too is their media planning analysis, where they should put their banner ads, who should see their banner ads, because you can't get a click if, if no one sees it. And most importantly, you want the right people to see it. So through marketing experiments research, we've created this uh, conversion sequence. Um, if you've attended a past webinar we've done, you're probably familiar with it. If not, you can go to marketingexperiments.com. We have uh, hundreds of uh, research experiments that we talk about on there. Just click on the research directory and you can learn more about this conversion sequence. But I want to focus, I'm going to talk about one other element later. I want to focus on that 4M number, okay? This heuristic is basically a thinking tool that marketers can use to help them identify both the challenges and opportunities uh, that marketing faces to get higher conversion. And you can notice the highest coefficient is for M. That stands for motivation, okay? Because as we all know, the more motivated a customer is, the more likely they are to convert. So you can't you, know, you can only do so much to convert motivation, but one thing you want to do is tap into motivation. One way marketers are doing this is through behavioral targeted ads. According to the IAB, you know, 80% or more of digital campaigns were touched by behavioral targeting in some way. According to our own research through Marketing Sherpa, behaviorally targeted ads are second only to contextually targeted ads, right? And that, that's an important key takeaway for advertisers, that the context in which an ad is served, is served is just as important as the ad itself, right? So think about direct marketing in the traditional world. The list is the most important variable in of success. If the consumer is not in the proper state of mind, they simply don't fall into the group of people who would ever have a reason to consider that product, that impression is wasted. Okay? If I have a refrigerator, the refrigerator works fine, I have no intention of buying a refrigerator, no matter how many refrigerator ads you show me, I'm not going to click. So from an ROI perspective, you want to eliminate those wasted impressions. Make a good impression by serving up advertising that ties into those motivations. That's consistently the best option for advertisers, which is what we found. So along with that, we wanted to ask you a question, put together a poll, and see for you what percentage of your ads are util utilizing behavioral, ad uh, behavioral targeting. In the meantime, while that poll's running, um, let's see, I have a question here from Chris. Isn't a whitelist contrary to what the icon notice experience is supposed to achieve? Bob, do you want to... Uh, to answer that uh, while we're while we have the uh, poll going on, Chris asks, "Isn't a whitelist contrary to what the icon slash notice experience is supposed to achieve?" So um, I, I think, Chris, what uh, you may be asking is relative to the whitelist in browsers versus um, icons that lead to opt-outs that run through cookies. And I, I think uh, our point of view on this is that browser-based choice setting, whether it's with whitelist, blacklist plugins, et cetera, can be consistent and work together with server-side opt-out cookies. And, and I think maybe for some of the audience, we may be getting ahead of ourselves, but this is a very good question because historically opt-outs 
have been through cookies that each ad serving technology sets and allows a consumer to opt out. We're seeing the rise of browsers actually creating lists such as whitelists and blacklists which may block ad, uh, ad requests at the browser themselves. And so um, uh, we, we think those two can coexist and as we, as we dig into it, uh, uh, we'll talk about how uh, at least conceptually we are advising people in terms of how to manage both the browser side and the server side uh, uh, issues as they emerge. All right, thanks for that, Bob, and thank you for that question, Chris. And just to remind you, you can ask your questions through GoToWebinar or using the Twitter hashtag SherpaWebinar. Let's take a look at those poll results now. Justin, can you display those results? And uh, let's see, what do people say? So that, that's interesting. Most people don't know. I, I, that's a, I, hmm, Bob, Bob, what have you found uh, in talking to marketers out there? I find that very interesting that, that uh, well, of the people that know, less than 10% are using behavioral targeting, which is different, very different from the IAB numbers we saw, uh, where a large percentage of um, behavioral ads are targeted. But what's interesting to me is that how many don't know that they, they may be using it and not even know, and they may be possibly in uh, danger of uh, some compliance violations. What, what have you noticed? I, I think what we're seeing, and um, by all means, uh, anyone in the audience, please chime in. Uh, I, I think what we're seeing is one reason why the government is poking their heads in, one reason why the industry is trying to self-regulate, and one reason why consumers are concerned because uh, I think many, uh, many of us in the business of advertising have been using uh, uh, ingredients, techniques that uh, by implication are OBA, are behavioral, and have uh, behavioral uh, characteristics to them without knowing it. And I think that uh, subconscious use of that has created concerns with consumers, government, and the industry itself. So I see this as very symptomatic where we've been doing things, as, as advertisers, we engage in practices that lead to good results. Now we're being asked to look at those practices to see what implications they have for consumers, especially, especially along privacy. And I think that's new for a lot of people to go back and scrutinize those techniques along a privacy dimension. Well, one reason those marketers might not know uh, is, Bob, is because they might not know exactly what online behavioral advertising is. So can you give us some examples of what online behavioral advertising is and what it is not? Absolutely. And I'll, what I'll try to do as we talk about this, I'll describe OBA as we, as, as, as business people, as marketers, as how we think about it. But I'll also reference how it is defined in the self-regulatory principles, principles with a capital P, the Constitution I mentioned, because while there's a, def there's a common definition that you would think of in, in marketing circles, there's also a self-regulatory definition, which is uh, a negotiated legal definition, which is distinct. So uh, what OBA is, keeping that in mind, what OBA is, is using behavioral uh, uh, browsing history to make a targeting decision. So what falls under that, typical types of, of, of practices, is number one is is retargeting. Uh, many of our clients uh, in the world at large, you see retargeting used uh, uh, significantly. And that's a form of behavioral advertising because it, it uses the fact that a consumer landed on a, um, uh, on a, let's say, a store landing page to target them later on a third party site. And the second type of, of behavioral advertising is using cookie tracking, whether it's for retargeting purposes for uh, customer segmentation purposes or uh, to target uh, consumers across a, a, a vast set of unaffiliated websites. And then finally, uh, uh, using behavior to determine, let's say, a demo, meaning based on my behavior, am I male uh, 25 to 45 interested in sports? If you're using behavioral history to, cr to make that demo decision, then that would be considered OBA. One important thing about the demarcation, the legal demarcation, as set out in the principles between what is and isn't OBA, is first party versus third party. So I'll use a large publisher example like Microsoft. If Microsoft is collecting behavioral targeting, but using that only in the context of Microsoft sites, sites own and operated, own and operated Microsoft sites, while that is OBA in concept, because it's not third party, it is not considered OBA under the principles. 
So when it is third party, when you're collecting data from a third party to use it on your site, or you are collecting on your site to use it on third party sites, that's when the principal definition of OBA kicks in. So on the, on the side of what is not OBA, as I mentioned, first party is not OBA. What we think of as contextual advertising, so uh, you have a sports product, you target it on ESPN, but there's no other decisioning beyond that. That's not uh, 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 OBA. Um, and then finally, many of the tracking that we do at, at the ad serving level, for example, frequency capping, analytics reporting, ad sequencing, basic machinery of the ad server is not considered OBA either. So you see it's sort of a, 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 a black and white, but there's some gray area in the middle as well. Okay, thanks, Bob. And I also just want to clarify, we have this great comment on the Twitter hashtag uh, Sherpa Webinar. I want to clarify that that poll we did was not for scientific purposes that we're going to publish in any way. We were just trying to get a sense of what the audience on the webinar knows and, and what they're familiar with and what they're not. You know, a lot of our Sherpa charts, those are actually, those are a rigorous scientific process or published to, uh, to uh, represent what marketers as a whole think. Uh, because we had a great comment from at the Hewitt on uh, Sherpa, hashtag Sherpa Webinar. All responses are a function of audience. Presumably, audience is learning behavioral targeting may not already use. It's a very good point. <laughs> if you come onto a, a webinar to learn about behavioral targeting, you might not know much about it. So thanks for that point. But with that, let's move on to uh, Spencer again. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, the traffic funnel analysis. Well, and this is exactly why marketers are looking at behavioral marketing. Uh, primarily, this is a, um, a an image of what the sales funnel is. And what we're looking at at the top is page views, page views and impressions. So that's the home page. Then we're looking at the banner clicks. So the more people you get started into the funnel, the more you get through the landing page and then conversions or sales. So that is what we're looking at. That's the top uh, key performance indicator is sales. So uh, this survey in the bottom right corner from the, um, this was, uh, published on Marketing Sherpa, but came from eMarketer. Worldwide, banners are getting clicked at a 0.09%. So for every 1,000 impressions, the banner is getting clicked nine times. So the idea is that you might not be able to increase the number of times it's clicked, but you certainly want to have the qualified traffic to be better, and that's where OBA comes from. So, Bob, did you have uh, anything to add to that? Uh, Statistic, uh, absolutely, and I think um, I think you're exactly right. And if you if um, you read sort of the broader um, marketing thinking, what you often hear is this movement towards buying uh, not ads but audiences. And OBA is a way to begin to not buy the ESPN ad or an ad in a context, but to buy the person, the audience you want, and so that helps ensure that the clicks you get are higher quality because they're self-qualified. And of course, as you mentioned, the downstream conversion uh, uh, by definition should be higher. So it, it, it's an interesting movement towards audience that OBA is, is also part of. Exactly. And, and frankly, it's what Google always talks about. They want to give the visitors exactly what they want when they're doing a search. So that's why they're always changing the rhythms. Uh, and making sure that the visitor is getting what they want, not what the marketers want to give them. So uh, that's the other side of it. So let's go into the next step of it and looking at the message that we're presenting to people through the sales funnel. It's very important. Our copy and call to action match the landing page and match the application page. And you're presenting a value proposition that accurately and clearly describes your company, your service, and your product. So, well, and uh, we will work with the Marketing uh, Sherpa Optimization Summit. As you see on the left there, you have the banner. Uh, this was on the home page uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, it says, apply the science of optimization to your marketing. Uh, if you look, that headline goes on to the article with Dr. Flint McLaughlin on the landing page, the Optimation Summit 2011 always goes right through from banner to landing page to application. The call to action is a limited time offer. Now this is another shameless plug, the limited time offer ends today. 
So if you have any thought about going to the optimization summit and you want to save $700, you need to take action today. So that goes right through to the application page. And then you see on the landing page the call to action, register. And then on the application page, you have registration information. So people know where they're going. They know what they to expect. And frankly, they want to buy what we're selling, hopefully, uh, and then have a great experience in Atlanta. Um, so going on, this is, uh, we work a lot with heuristics. This is the online ad sequence. It's very similar to the conversion index, but it's specific for online ads. And the EA is the effective ad. The most important part of that is getting somebody's attention by a factor of two, and then you want to build interest, and then you want to ask for the click. Every ad has its own value proposition and should address a specific need. If you're not doing that, it's not going to be effective. So methods to capture attention. First, you're looking at different creatives. So those are the elements, whether it's color, size, shape, motion, text. You've seen them all. You've seen the flash. You've seen the cute, cute puppy dogs, all the other things. These tables are about size, what I bring your attention to. It's a little confusing, but to explain the whole gamut of it, you have a 468 by 60 here on the right, on the, on the bottom right here, and you have the same full banner right here to give you an indication. That would be a typical ad across the top of a website. A skyscraper, which is a very typical one that is on the right or left side, that's a 120 by 600, will catch twice as many clicks because it has twice as, twice as much attention. Then you've got the small ones, the micro bar, you're looking at about a 0.2%. Uh, point two for the full banner. So just to give you an idea of the effect of, of uh, size. One of the things we talk a lot about is banner blindness. We've all been on the web for many years now. We know where the banners are. Unfortunately, many times those banner ads do not fulfill a need that we have. So in essence, we ignore them. It doesn't satisfy our needs, so why should I be here? So in this uh, heat map study, uh, in the first visit, you see that on the left side there, uh, right here, you see where the banners are. There's a little bit of attention paid there, but primarily it's where the red, the orange is, where people are getting their content, headline, and information. Number two, this ad actually changed. A lot of people talk about it. Well, I changed my ads. Why aren't they being more effective? You didn't move them. People expect them to be there. Okay. And then on the third, what I find interesting about the third is down here in the bottom, there's some sort of uh, calendar or information. I couldn't tell what it was, but there is some intention paid there where there's none here. So that's an indication of banner blindness. So if you have a website, you want to get those banners working better, move them around. So I'm a Boston Red Sox fan. It is actually opening day today, so yay for that. Um, I wish we had a poll. I couldn't talk them into having a poll. I would have had how many people like the Red Sox and nobody else, so we would have had an 100%. But uh, I go to Boston.com on a regular basis, and as you see, uh, JetBlue is spending a lot of money with Boston.com. They want you to know that they have flights available out of Boston. There are also three other strategies on this page for advertising. And what I'd like you to do is take about 20 seconds to take a look and see whether you can see the other three strategies. One of them is very obvious, and there are two ads, and then there's two individual ads that have different strategies. And use, ha ha use the Twitter hashtag Sherpa webinar if you found something else. We'd love to see how many people can find that from the other strategies. But we're not going to wait long. So here we go. The methods to capture attention, we have the takeover strategy. Bang, 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 bang. They're, they're spending a lot of money. They're probably paying by impression. With uh, bostongod.com, they're getting a lot of attention there. The other is you have the blend in, and that's number four right here. This is a monster.com sponsored link. Okay, people looking for a job in Boston are going to see that, and they're going to click on that, and they're going to go straight to Monster. That's probably a very, very effective ad. It's filling in for what the need of a certain group, especially in this economy, are looking for. They're looking for a job. The other one you have is the Chambers Cadillac right here. They're sponsoring the video for the day, and then you have the typical ads here. 
So this one is probably pretty good. These are okay. They're in the, the uh, content of it, um, but people know it's ads, so it's probably okay. So methods to build interest, we have, we need to match the visitor's needs. Each one has its own value proposition. And if you don't demonstrate value, you will not, you may get a click, but you're going to get a bounce back. It might be somebody's, uh, uh, they're curious, the curiosity click. And if you're doing PPC and you're getting curiosity clicks, you're in trouble because you're wasting a lot of money. So this one on the left here, this banner identifies a need, okay? Don't fear the opt-out. And if you're doing email marketing and uh, you fear the opt-out, um, you're kind of missing the boat because, in fact, I don't want to send emails to people who don't want my emails. I don't want to bother them. They don't want me to bother them, so it's a win-win. Here you go is half off the best eats in town. Okay. It's a living social, so they're actually trying to give you specials in the area. So it's interesting. I might click it, but I might not be getting what I want. And then over here, this very cute dog, traveldog.net. Okay, uh, what is he trying to sell? Um, not sure. Um, I know it's an ad, but I don't know what it's for. So you see the difference in each one of those ads. You need to make sure your ads are attempting to give a value proposition and address a need for your visitors. Uh, here we talk a little bit about the online and offline marketing area. And I'm sure some of you do email, direct mail, and other offline or online marketing efforts to help with your website sales and conversion. And I think this is where the uh, behavioral ads are really coming in. And I'd like uh, Bob to kind of talk about, because this is one of the best ways to really up your marketing effectiveness. Uh, is hitting people in different ways. But uh, I find that this is probably, folks who are really doing this is, is, is getting into the privacy area. No, definitely. I mean, one of, the, one of the power of OBA is that you can sit down and think about the segments of audiences that are most receptive to your message. And you may have different goals. You may have a conversion goal versus a reach goal. Uh, you may have a click goal. And so what OBA lets you do is very systematically uh, uh, put uh, audiences into buckets, you can, many OBA tools allow you to create custom segments. Some OBA tools have already pre-created segments. And so there's a lot of opportunity to really calibrate for your marketing goals, for what your underlying products and services are. But as you do that, what you're doing is harnessing data that consumers have implicitly provided through their browsing history. And, and that's when you trigger concerns about uh, uh, privacy uh, from a consumer standpoint as well as from a regulatory standpoint. So just like many very powerful tools, they have side effects. And so, you know, from a uh, you know when we advise clients, we want them to see privacy as an enable and as an enabler. Meaning, if they take the right steps to protect privacy and to give notice to consumers, it enables them to use these tools in a more powerful way. Uh, while doing it safely. Great. Thank you, Bob. And one of the things to keep in mind here is to make sure that you've got continuity in your messaging, whether it's email, direct mail, or online. They all need to look and feel the same, have the same value proposition, the same call to action. Uh, you can change the, um, the incentive as you go through in the sales process, but make sure that that message uh, is consistent. Um, and next, we're going to be looking at as the last part of the banner's job is asking for the click. A simple call to action, a simple ask for the click is most effective, whether it's limited time offer, learn more, uh, order now, um, the creative call to action or no call to action at all uh, really decreases the effectiveness of that. So you need to have a clear, simple uh, call to action to manage the visitor's thought process. Here's an interesting uh, test case that was done. It was uh, published in Marketing Sherpa. It was done by uh, Inside Express back in March of 2008. The goal was to increase brand recognition for both, both Volvo and Mitsubishi. These are rotating banners. Uh, the Volvo, all they did was add the logo in the top right corner of all three panes, all three slides, and they got an 86% increase in their brand recognition. 
Uh, Mitsubishi was a little bit more creative and added uh, the Mitsubishi Pajero slide in between the other two storyboard slides, and they had a 219% increase. Now, just think about how inexpensive it was to change their banner that little. And can you imagine if your website all of a sudden got 219% more effective, would that hit your bottom line? So that's what we're talking about here. Just easy tweaks can really increase the effectiveness of your banners. Another important method when you ask for a click, you have to make sure you're overcoming the anxiety of your potential customer. So again, going back to our marketing experiments conversion sequence, you can see one of the negative elements there that, that minus 2A is anxiety. We found through our research that that's one of the a major factor that hinders conversion because customers are anxious what's going to happen once they, once they go through, for example, with clicking on the banner ad. In fact, a recent USA Today Gallup poll found that two-thirds of American internet users don't think advertisers should be allowed to match ads to their browsing history. So how can you overcome that anxiety that they might have when they're clicking on your ad. Well, one thing we teach the marketing experiments is you have to strive for transparency and clarity in your marketing. You can learn a lot more about this through uh, mark at marketingexperiments.com slash transparent. There's a free download there. It's called Transparent Marketing, written by our founder, Dr. Philip McLaughlin. It's a great insight into how you should be marketing now when, uh, unlike marketing in the past, when um, the only publishers were, you know, the rich brands and advertisers who could afford to get out to the audience, Everyone is a publisher now. Everyone can be on social media. And as we joked a little bit about Libya and some of the what's going on uh, overseas right now, um, you can see the power of social media. That not only can it topple a dictatorship and a government, you know, it can very easily topple your brand as well. So, so how can you overcome that anxiety with your customers? Here's here's a few of the key points we found. And I'm going to ask Bob to speak a little more about this. Um, one, you want to have whatever factor you're using to overcome that anxiety, that credibility indicator, we call it. It's more powerful if it's close to that source of anxiety, of course. Uh, you want it to be very specific. You want to be very clear about how you're trying to overcome that anxiety. You want it to consider the intensity of it. We teach you have to overcorrect for that anxiety. And anxiety, you have to remember, is something in the mind of the consumer. It's not necessarily a rational thought. Uh, and in that case, um, as we all know, when someone thinks something, whether it's true or not, perception is reality. So you have to overcome it very strongly with true substance. And then you have to strive for authority. You have to make sure that what you're using to try to overcome that anxiety is something that will instantly, your customers will instantly recognize and will instantly matter to them and instantly have credibility. Yeah. So along with that, Bob, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about the impact of emerging, emerging privacy regulations and how that might affect customers and how we can overcome their anxiety. Absolutely. And just, just to echo that, what I think we've seen uh, with consumers when, when on the trustee front we've done surveys is Consumers assume the worst, and because I think as an as, as an industry, the online advertising industry, uh, I would say historically hasn't been as transparent as, as, as transparent as we could be. What's happening is consumers are filling in the blanks with their worst fears. They think we're actually transmitting their names, their credit card numbers, etc., between uh, platforms. When in fact, what's happening is is a little more subtle, a li much more anonymous, and I think. What we are seeing is the industry movement towards self-regulation is a first step for all of us to collectively begin setting the record straight with consumers through ongoing education. So uh, what you see on this slide is, is, is a summary of, of exactly that trend. So as we all said earlier, online uh, behavioral advertising, very powerful, two times performance impact, and that's just one NAI study. I've seen even bigger numbers. At the same time, both consumers as well as regulators are concerned that the world of um, data relating to advertising is still a wild west. It's, when you think about the infrastructure that carries data for targeting purposes, it's the same stuff that was back there in 1996, 1997 as the first ad servers came online. And so there's concerns that not only is there no, no transparency to consumers, but also that the underlying infrastructure isn't addressing the privacy needs and security that consumers are looking for. So enter the DAA, the, the Digital Advertising Alliance, which as I mentioned launched last October. And what you may, the icon you see here, what's sometimes referred to as the forward icon or the forward eye, uh, the official name is the advertising option icon, has been the uh, face of self-regulation. You may have seen it in, in ads, you may have heard about it. 
from agencies or from your marketing team. And it is this icon that is being used to indicate to consumers that it's being placed on ads, it's being placed on pages, and it's sort of the recycling symbol, as you may, uh, uh, in a way, that's supposed to indicate to consumers that this icon, if you click on it, will, will lead you to a place that you can make choices, in other words, opt out of being targeted on a behavioral basis. Thanks. Along, uh, along with that, Bob, we wanted to get a sense, you know, we're throwing around terms like DAA. And we wanted to uh, do a poll and get a sense for how many, you know, uh, our audience's familiarity with the Digital Advertising Alliance. And again, this is just to, to get our sense for our audience on this webinar, not, uh, you know, that we're not using this for scientific purposes. We had a few questions that I wanted to go through while uh, we wait for this poll to be filled out. Uh, Peggy wanted to know the article, again, that I mentioned is Transparent Marketing. Uh, transparent Marketing can be found at marketingexperiments.com slash transparent. Uh, it's marketingexperiments.com slash transparent. We also had a few questions on hashtag Sherpa webinar on Twitter. Uh, this question is for you, Bob. It's from at Sirtuich. That's my best guess of the pronunciation. Uh, how can trustee tell specifically how many people have opted out from each OBA campaign? So um, we have a technology we call Trusted Ads, which helps advertisers and agencies and an ad network provide this notice, meaning the icon as well as the opt-out. We instrument the entire consumer experience, so the display of the icon, uh, if a consumer clicks on the icon, and all of the opt-out experience behind that so that we can report back on a campaign-by-campaign, advertiser-by-advertiser basis exactly how many impressions of the icon were served, how often was that icon clicked, and what was the opt-out rate. And what we found is some uh, advertisers want to know the overall opt-out rate. Some advertisers want to know if they use four OBA ingredients, let's say. Uh, what are the opt-out rates of each ingredient to know, if, uh, do they have a marketing partner that, is, has, that, for example, has a higher opt-out rate for some reason. So uh, the instrumentation that we, we do in our technology allows for very, very detailed reporting, and, and that's pretty valuable to know how consumers are interacting with uh, your practice. I think so. So let's take a look at this poll. It's, um, it's uh, pretty eye-opening. 90% roughly really are not at all familiar with uh, DAA regulations and OBA compliance or not very familiar. That's, that's a pretty big uh, number on this uh, call. So uh, Bob, why don't you go through just quickly, you know, what's going on in the news for those that aren't familiar. I know I talked about just a few articles that came out today and I've been tracking uh, the cover of Time Magazine uh, and uh, Wall Street Journal has uh, had a, uh, an extensive year-long um, investigation into, they call it what they know, and a lot of the uh, privacy uh, implications that are going on with digital tracking. So it, it's been in the news a lot lately. Well, if you could briefly touch on that, Bob, and then go into and tell us a little more about DAA self-regulatory programs. Absolutely. So uh, I think, uh, as you mentioned, there's been an increasing awareness, an awareness both at the regulatory level. So if you look today inside the U.S. government, the FTC historically has been the lead on privacy regulation. And uh, I think, as, as we mentioned, for example, the, um, the FTC just uh, hit Google with a consent decree around the, the, the privacy issues around the buzz launch. So they have historically been very much the forward part of the government that's focused on privacy regulation. And they've begun to set their sights on the advertising industry and understanding what's going on there. But there's other emerging players. The White House itself has a committee now, a standing committee on privacy and online privacy. Legislatures, there's been at least three or four privacy bills over the last 12 months, the latest of which is a, a bill by John Kerry that has some tacit support from McCain and others. And privacy is emerging as a bipartisan issue. Now, the, each side of the aisle has different ideas about how to address it, but it seems to be consensus that privacy is something that, that at least they want to talk about, if not move on. And then finally, the Department of Commerce uh, a, uh, has now emerged as another element of the government that's beginning to look at privacy. So it's in that context, and a lot of it is driven by consumer awareness, some of the investigative reporting that the Wall Street Journal and others have done. But in that context, the DAA has emerged as the industries, the ad industry's answer to those pressures. And what the DAA is doing is it's, it's the DAA itself 
is made up of other ad industry associations, for example, the IAB, the 4As, the NAI, the DMA, and others. And it is engaging in a program that is asking everyone who engages in online behavioral advertising. So whether you're an ad network, an advertiser, a publisher uh, of, of a website, we are moving towards a regime, and, and this is going to begin in the next uh, 30 to 60 days, where the, the DAA, through some of these uh, uh, associated associations, will begin actual enforcement of self-regulatory principles, meaning they will begin to monitor to see if people who engage in OBA are actually displaying the icon, providing choice mechanisms, and for those who are not, they are going to start by sending enforcement letters, and then for, for non-compliant uh, actors who don't respond to uh, uh, enforcement letters, there is a, a movement to actually refer those uh, uh, actors to the FTC for investigation. And as we've seen in the case of Google, the FTC is taking a much more proactive approach of investigating and taking action against those referrals. So I, I don't want to suggest that the sky is falling, but we're beginning to move towards a, a, a regime where uh, it, from a uh, privacy standpoint, from, from a consumer standpoint, it's the right thing to do to give additional transparency and choice. But over and above that, there is this enforcement risk that actors in the online ad space face when they use uh, OBA. And that's something that as you, as, as you consider uh, uh, using different marketing techniques, and my guess is many of you implicitly are using OBA, definitely keep in mind that self-regulatory risk, which initially is just a letter, but ultimately could could uh, have uh, have you dancing with the FTC at some point. Bob, before we get into DAA, which I know we're, we're just about to, I wanted to ask you, uh, like in one of those Wall Street Journal uh, articles I mentioned from this morning, it talked about in just the past few weeks, in just a few weeks, those agencies that are now talking to, I believe, Microsoft about Internet Explorer and the uh, Do Not Track that they're uh, willing to implement have changed their mind. They were, they were against it a few weeks ago, and now they're into a very fast, evolving, moving issue. And so we had a question on the hashtag Sherpa webinar. Uh, is there an organization or website that you could recommend that tracks government and industry regulation developments for OBA? Do, do you have any good ones? So uh, there, uh, the one I would might recommend is the Online Trust Alliance. Um, the OTA has um, uh, uh, a good a good analysis. Uh, the IAPP, uh, uh, and I always forget the acronym, it's the um, uh, Industry Association of Privacy People, I think, literally. Um, they have uh, on their web on their website, which is, I believe, the .org, um, has great resources. And then FTC.gov, uh, if you, I think there is a tab there that leads to a um, a legislative summary. So the FTC does a good job of, of summarizing and aggregating uh, what's going on inside the government as it relates to privacy. So I think those are those are good resources. And then the DAA's own website, which you're going to get more of the industry spin on this, but it's still valuable, uh, obviously, because I think that's some good good insights. Uh, the DAA's own website is about ad.info. Okay, great. And uh, now tell us a little more about the DAA self-regulatory program, if you would. Absolutely. So as I mentioned, uh, the DAA, uh, the program itself, is built on these principles. And you see here, basically, uh, uh, some of these principles uh, summarized the, 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 in these five bullet points. But uh, number one, it's, it's, uh, maybe I'll simplify it even uh, a little bit more than even these five points. But number one, it's about providing notice, meaning uh, uh, notice typically has been uh, in a privacy policy, so buried somewhere in a legal, complicated uh, document no consumer reads. What the DAA is asking is that people provide, uh, the terminology often used is enhanced notice, meaning pushing the notice out from the privacy policy into another link on the website, or pushing the notice out from the privacy policy into the ad itself by putting an icon on the ad. And then second, that notice should lead to a very simple explanation of the practices of the website or of the ad itself. And then the final principle really is choice. That once you've given enhanced notice, once you've given an explanation, give the consumer a choice. Present to them the ingredients, 
the partners you have that are either providing data, doing ad serving, et cetera, that are engaged in OVA, give those consumers a list of those companies and let them choose do they, do they want to stay targeted or do they want to opt out. And you know, it, the principles themselves, if you look at them, you can download them on the DAA website or a big, almost legalistic document. document. But at the heart of it, it's those three things. Enhanced notice, explanation, and choice. So now let's so, talk about the, go, sorry, go on, Bob. By all means, by all means. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the question often becomes is, is, is what, what do I do about this? Um, uh, number one, I think uh, our advice is do something. Uh, privacy as an issue is not going away. Uh, privacy in the online ad space is not going away. And in fact, uh, I think if you, if you talk to our policy analysts, the trustee, uh, and our analysts who look at the ad industry, we see this as a maturation of the ad space itself. So again, um, I, I joke about this sometimes with our internal team. We have some early double clickers with us who often remind me that you know how data is used on the web is still the same stuff they built back, as I mentioned, in the, in the mid-90s. And so what's happening is while there's a, a policy issue around privacy, the underlying infrastructure is beginning to mature. We're beginning to upgrade it to you know, a 21st century infrastructure and, and, and not um, uh, what we had in the 90s. And so whether it's a policy reason, a compliance reason, or simply a technology reason, uh, we see an imperative for everyone who's engaging in, in online marketing and using OBA to begin looking at how to move forward, whether it's with the icon and self-regulation, whether it's with address, addressing what the browsers are doing, or whether it's thinking about uh, uh, more consciously about the practices you're using to target consumers and, and to collect that data and so forth. So uh, as I mentioned, the, the principles uh, of, of enhanced notice, explanation, and, and choice. And we, what you see here on this slide is an example of what that looks like inside an ad itself. So if your ads are using OVA, uh, there is an obligation under the DAA self-regulatory principles to provide this ad marker or this icon. And you see it there in the top uh, corner of the ad. There's in fact the IAB has issued creative guidelines for exactly uh, what that icon should look like, where it should be placed, how the ad marker should be shaped and so forth. And, and if anyone has any questions about that, uh, you know, after this webinar we can follow up with you and, and give you more explanation on that. But as you can see, in the case of an of a in-ad notice like this, the icon of the ad marker clicks to a clean, simple explanation about what here this advertiser ABC Bank is doing. From that explanation, the consumer can click forward to this opt-out manager. You see an example of a, of a trustee version of that. It has a list of companies in, that were involved in the delivery and targeting of the, the ad for ABC Bank. And as you can see there, you see those little check boxes. Consumers can click to opt out of any one, or can click, click to opt out of all. And so as you think about how to approach compliance, what we suggest is think about it in terms of, of leveraging a platform. Because uh, there's technology involved in not just putting the icon in the ad, and typically that's done through a, a JavaScript tag, but you also need the back-end monitoring to make it make sense. So uh, I think we, we mentioned um, also that the browsers are beginning to emerge as a significant player in, in mediating privacy. And uh, we, uh, as you can see here by the slide, that each, of, each browser has different functions to help protect consumer privacy. But for each of these uh, companies, Microsoft especially recently, they see privacy as a differentiator, as a point of competition versus the other uh, browser providers. And so what we're beginning to see is the emergence of more sophisticated, more uh, aggressive privacy features uh, from all of the browser companies. And those features have implications because they can, as I mentioned, block ad calls at the point of the browser before anyone ever sees that call. And that obviously has implications for how well uh, you can target, how well you can reach your consumers, how well you can count impressions, and, and, and so forth. If you go to the next slide. 
So one of those examples of, of a browser that's beginning to use privacy as a differentiator is Microsoft. Uh, just several weeks ago, uh, Microsoft announced IE9. And as part of IE9, they're providing a new feature called Tracking Protection Lists, or TPLs. And what these TPLs are are bundles of domains that are either uh, allowed or blocked. Uh, and what Microsoft has, has decided to do is, is work with several companies. There's four companies they're working with. Trustee is one of them. To uh, have those companies curate a list of allow and block companies. And that way, consumers can basically install the list without having a consumer go back and make choices one by one about companies. Rather, consumers can rely on these four providers of lists to, make, to help them make that decision, depending on what their affinities are. And these blocks, these TPLs, um, uh, can be installed by consumers. And they will, at the level of the ad call, either allow or block. And what's interesting is that any, let's say there's four lists, if the consumer installs all four lists because they have an affinity with all four list providers, any one allow list, any one white listing overrides all other uh, block listings. So as you think about your own practices and your partners and how you uh, uh, um, uh, might protect yourself in the browsers, it's important to think about how do you get on the right allow list so that at least for IE9, uh, you're protected against just automatically being blocked. Now, a consumer can still go and choose to opt out, let's say, of one of your ad partners or your ad cookie, but it's not an auto block if you're on an allow. Thanks, thanks a lot, Bob, for that overview. We covered a lot of ground today, a lot of ground talking about online banner optimization, talking about the privacy implications. I wonder if Spencer and Bob, you could each just give me maybe a one-minute summary at a high level of, of the top things uh, a marketer should worry about first. How about you, Spencer? Well, in thinking about your banners, regardless of what uh, platform they're on or what uh, technology you use to use them, you need to have the three things. You need to get their attention, you need to build the interest, and then you need to um, ask for the click. And you need that clear value proposition for your product or service of why people would want to buy your product or service. So those are the four keys that I'd look at in your banners, regardless of how you create it, uh, whether it's flash or whether it's uh, sta static or, or whichever way. So that's what I would say. Bob? And uh, to, to um, echo that is there's a lot of very powerful marketing tools at, at your disposal. One of those is online behavioral advertising, unbelievably powerful to reach the right audience. Um, think of privacy, as I said, as an enablement to that. Uh, if you cover your privacy bases, you'll be able to to, to, to use those powerful tools to their fullest extent. Thank you. We uh, created an extensive checklist here, uh, Spencer did at least, to help you walk through optimizing your own online banner ads. We're not going to have a chance to go through it right now, but I'm clicking through it to make sure it is captured for the replay. This replay will be distributed through the Marketing Sherpa Best of the Week newsletter. You can go to marketingsherpa.com to sign up for that newsletter. And then on the replay, that will give you a chance to pause each screen and go through the checklist and determine uh, you know, to help you optimize your own banner ads. But speaking of optimization, as Spencer mentioned, the Marketing Sherpa Marketing Firm's Optimization Summit. Today is the very last day. You have near hours to save $700 on our super early bird. It's going to be in Atlanta. We're going to have a bunch of our researchers there. We also have Marketing Sherpa case studies, as well as brand side marketers like you to help teach you how they've um, optimized their banner ads, as well as their landing pages, emails, cards, paths, lots of different things. I've even been talked into and tricked into by uh, Todd Lebo here, our uh, Senior Director of Content to uh, speak about statistical significance and confidence levels in your online testing. Those are really important uh, topics that we found most marketers don't realize how important they are. They just tend to test because everyone else is testing and not understand the importance of whether they're actually learning something, whether what they're seeing is random chance or whether what they're seeing really represents what's going on in the real world. So again, you can go to marketingsherpa.com slash optimization summit and uh, learn more about that. And also, Bob, I know you want to talk about Trustee briefly and the 3,000 companies you've been helping. Absolutely. So as, as you mentioned, Trustee is a uh, company focused on privacy and privacy services. We provide certification monitoring across websites, uh, mobile platforms, advertising, and uh, the entire enterprise. We have uh, more than 3,000 uh, clients that rely on us, uh, some of the biggest brands in the world. Uh, we work with brands as well as ad platforms, uh, as well as 
uh, uh, publisher website. And uh, if, if you have any needs around privacy, and especially if, if OBA compliance, as we discussed today, is something you think that's necessary for your business, don't hesitate to come to us, and we're happy to help. Okay, thanks a lot, Bob, for answering a lot of questions on this call. You can uh, email Bob directly. He's, uh, I wouldn't have done it, but Bob's a kind of, kind of got an eye on it, and he's, uh, <laughs> his email address is bobb at trustee.com. There's a few more resources on that slide as well. Please remember, when you close out of this webinar, a survey is going to pop up. That survey helps us optimize these webinars and make them better for you and serve you better. So please don't hesitate to let us know what you thought of this content. And with that, I'd like to thank Spencer Whiting and Bob from Trustee for being on this webinar and uh, teaching me personally. <laughs> I learned a lot about both privacy and online banner ad optimization. Thanks, guys. Glad to be here. Bye-bye. Thank you.